Luke 13, 23. All right, here we go. It says, Then said one of them unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? Is that a good question? Yeah. You, you understand? The Jews was understanding. They saw that there was thousands of Jews that was around them, and that only a small portion of them was was accepting Christ as their Messiah. The majority was rejecting him. The Bible said he came into his own, and his own received him not. Amen. And so only a few of them was, was coming. And so they had a good question. Because sometimes we think that Jesus went in, spoke in the Holy Land, and everybody in Israel and, and, and all the surrounding areas trusted Christ. <laughs> There's millions of Jews over there, and out of those millions of Jews, you only find where he had 11 disciples. One of them was the devil. And even they got down to, even he said, will you also go away? You find 120 in one accord after the resurrection of Christ. And so when you pull those numbers and you start thinking about the thousands that were saved, but then it kind of dwindles down to a few disciples, I think it's a good question. Yeah. He says, he says, is there just a few that's going to be saved? And he said to them, strive to enter in at the straight gate. The word straight gate means the narrow way. He says, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. He said, many will seek to enter in. What will keep folks out of heaven that wants to go? So I said, sin? Not being saved? What, what, what's the things that will keep them? Religion will keep them out of from going in. Unbelief will keep them out of going in. Well, blasphemy of the Holy Ghost will keep you from going in. It's unforgivable sin. You don't even get close to the gate. You, you get a no trespassing sign. All right? But those things, materialism, things that, that thinks that they'll be able to do good works to get through the gate. There's a lot of people that labor to get in that gate. They try to, to do good works. They try to give. They try to keep the law. They're trying. They're working hard. It said many will be that seek to get in, but won't get in. Oh, uh, this is a sad thing, but good people die and go to hell. I, I think, I always said the two things that's going to be the biggest shock about heaven is the people that's there. And the second shock is people that's not there. <laughs> because we're going to be expecting some of our family members that we thought was good moral people, and we get up there and we find out they was depending on mama and daddy's religion and doing good to their neighbor, and they never trusted Christ. And we're going to find out, sometimes we're going to get there and find out that somebody on their deathbed trusted Christ as their Lord and Savior, and we're going to, we're going to be shocked to see them in heaven. We're just going to be shocked to see them. We're going, what are you doing here? And, and Aunt so-and-so is not here. And Christ said, because this person trusted me. It's a straight, it's a narrow way. Now, I want to give you something. We're going to look. We're going to be actually, because he talks about this more in Matthew than he does in Luke. Luke only barely talks about this. And then he and he and he gets into another subject. He gets into people coming in and knocking on the door in verse 25. When he talks about once the master of the house has risen up and has shut the door, you begin to stand without and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open us, and he shall answer and say to them, I know you not whence you are. I don't know who you are, is what he's saying. For shall you begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence and has taught us in our streets? And he shall say, I will tell you not whence you are. You depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. Well, they said, You ate with us, Jesus. You was there. Uh, Judas kissed the door to heaven and went to hell. You let that sink in. He reached over, give Jesus a kiss on the cheek. Jesus said, I am the door to heaven. He kissed the door to heaven and went to hell. Now that's getting close. You, hear me? You, you don't get more close than that. And I guarantee you, his lips will be burning for eternity as he didn't make that commitment on the Christ. Now look in Matthew chapter 7. And this is where it's going to get good. Matthew chapter 7. And I want to give you some, some good stuff from, from Matthew 7. Matthew 7. He says there's two gates. Look there with me in your Bible. In Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 and 14. And he mentions these, these two places. He says, enter ye in at the what? Straight gate. For wide is the gate and 
Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. So he talks about it. He said there's, there is, there's two gates. He calls it the straight and the what? Why? Then you say, uh, now by thinking of it that way, you know which one's got the most people going through it. Amen. One of them is straight, which means narrow, and the other one is why? So let me ask you, what's the most most going to be going through? The wide gate. The most is going in the, the wide gate. All right, he's got it up there. Enter ye into the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in there. There is two gates. Not only that, there's two ways. Look what he says about that. You say, what do you mean there's, there's two ways mentioned? He says it right here. He said one of them, he says, and broad is the way. Then he goes on in verse 14, he says, because straight is the gate and narrow, narrow is the way. So there's two ways. There's two gates. There's a broad gate and there's a straight gate, which is a narrow. And then he said there's two ways. And the, the ways is a broad way. And he says that it is a narrow way. You say, why is that important? Because he's not going to just say this one time and not going to say it just one way. He's going to say it multiple times and multiple ways to get his point across. You ever had your parents sit down and tell you something and tell you several different ways why they're right? They'll sit down and they say, I don't have to tell you this, but you don't need to do that because this reason and this reason and this reason and this reason and this reason. Amen. That, that, but y'all do that. Amen. Yeah. But they'll give you the, the reasons that they don't do it. And they say, I don't have to tell you this. I'm your parent. You should do it just because I said so. Some of y'all had the same parents I did. Alright, just because I said so. But they'll say, my dad used to tell me, he'd tell me sometimes, he'd say, son, I don't have to tell you, but I'm going to. And I want you to know. Listen, God don't have to tell us that there's a few people going to heaven, but he does. He don't have to tell us uh, uh, how many is going and how many is not and the ratio and the weather. He don't have to tell us anything. It's really, it, it doesn't, it don't do anything to let, uh, to, for us. But he's letting us know because uh, he's letting us know that straight's the gate and narrow, but few there be that find it. We're going to look at it. So he said, there's two, yeah, two gates, and he said, uh, there's two gates. One is straight, and one is wide. There's two ways. One is broad, and one is narrow. Now, let me show you something else. There is two destinations. You say, what are they? They're in these same two verses. Look at verse 13 and verse 14. He said here, enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to where? Destruction. Where? Destruction. Destruction. And many there be which go in, because straight is the gate, and there is the way that leadeth unto? Leadeth unto? Leadeth unto? Life. So there's two destinations. One is life, and the other is destruction. It's headed to destruction. Many there be that go in the, the wide gate goes to where? Destruction. The narrow gate or the straight gate goes to life. Now, I watched when I was growing up, they would say, choose behind door number one. Don't you ever, let's make a deal. Let's make a deal. I watched that when I was growing up. And they would come up and they would tell you, say, all right, behind door number one. You would have this behind door number two. And they'd have one be of this. And then they'd say, and then over here is door number three. Number three was like this big, sometimes huge thing. And they'd say behind door number one, it'd be this little bitty thing over here. And somebody'd be like, um, I want door number three. And they'd open it, it'd be like a Sanford Sun truck. And go, wah, 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 wah. And they'd open it. And over here, it would be a trip to the to the Bahamas and, a, and everything and, a, and a, uh, I mean it had all kinds of stuff in that little bitty thing, set of diamonds and I mean it all be just I mean just all this, listen he's saying here that brawl's the way that most people go but understand that way goes to destruction I always think it's kind of weird that I believe the devil controls Hollywood. Oh, yeah, I do. 
I do. I, I believe that he does. I believe he's the prince and the power of the air. I don't believe everything that it's on the air is bad, but I believe the majority of it is. Amen. I don't believe that a lot of it will be in heaven. I don't believe it will really believe in the millennial kingdom. No. You say, well, do you think there will be television in the millennial kingdom? Yeah, but if there is, it will be definitely a closed circuit TV. Amen. Amen. There won't be a lot of stuff on there. But you'll find as you look, what 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 will? What do you what do you think? He talks about narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. He says narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. So there's there's two gates, there's two ways, there's two destinations, there's two kinds of travelers. You say, what are they? He says in verse 13. How many is going in? Many there be which go in thereat. Verse 14 says at the end of it that goes into life and few there be that find it. So he says there's two types of travelers. There's many going in one. There's few going in the other. You say, you think he's really trying to get a point across? I believe he is trying to get a point across. He says there's two gates. One's big, one's little. He said there's, there one goes to life, one goes to death. He goes on to say that one of them is broad, one of them is narrow, one of them gives life, one of them gives destruction, one of them many goes in, one of them few goes in, and then he goes on, look down, and he says there's two kinds of trees. Look down on, in the next verse. He says in verse, uh, verse number 17, go down to verse 17. He's going to skip down. He says, so every good tree, he says, bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth Evil fruit. There's two kinds of trees. We've got the good tree and the tree. corrupt tree right here. All right? Then he says there's two kinds of fruit. What does he say that at? In the next verse, verse 18, the good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can the corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. So he said there's two types of fruit. There's good fruit and there's evil fruit. You you say, why are you, you harping on, on these, these differences? Because I think we as Christians in today's time, we have gotten to where everything's just kind of all molded together. There's not a right and wrong anymore. There's not, a, there's not a good and bad. We don't call it stealing, we call it embezzlement. We don't call it adultery. We call it having an affair. We, you know, we, we've renamed sin. We don't call it sodomy. We call it an alternative lifestyle. We don't name things. Listen, now God loves the adulterer. He loves the effeminate, the murderer, the, the idolater. He, lo he loves us all. He loves us all. But sin is still... Sin. We just renamed it. It sounds better. It sounds better. And so Jesus, he don't, he just said, look, I just want you to know, there's broad, there's narrow. There's good, there's evil. There's good tree, there's corrupt tree. There's, there's life, there's destruction. I like that my God has a right and wrong. <laughs> I need some absolutes in my life. With everything is so muddled and gray in our world which we live in, I like some absolutes. You know, a lot of times we get in decisions, and, I, and I've been guilty, and you have to. We get in there and say, well, you don't really know that, that that's really, really wrong. If you got to come at it like that, it's wrong. <laughs> it, it, the Bible says that which is not a faith is sin. If you don't know it's right, leave it alone. Just leave it alone. And you say, well, preacher, you ain't arrived yet. I know. But you know what? I do not believe that you should decide what's right and wrong by what your preacher does. Amen. <laughs> I believe we ought to decide what's right and wrong by what this book says. Amen. Because if, if the preacher does it, is it okay? If it's in this book says it's wrong? Amen. No. If it's right, it's right. If it's wrong, it's wrong. And I've always tried to say, look, if you see something in me that's wrong, follow the book. I'd write with it. Because we're not going to give an account to me. We're going to give an account right. to God. Right. You don't have to confess your sins to me. I can't do a thing with them. Yeah, that's right. Amen. I, thanks, brother. I, make, I appreciate that. Amen. But, uh, <laughs> but he talks about the good and uh, the evil. Two kinds of fruit, good and evil. And then he goes on in verse 24 down through 29. He even likens it again. And he talks about... 
two different kinds of houses. And we know this story. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man that built his house upon a rock. And he says, And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell not, because it was founded on a rock. Verse 26, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. You say, what's going on? I'm telling you what's going on is that Jesus was drawing parallels to say, listen folks, there is only one way. There is only one path that leads to life and few there be that find it. You say, well, man, do you really think heaven's going to be empty? Oh no, I believe heaven's going to be full. I believe heaven's going to be full. I, I believe in the United States of America, I believe we've sent up a whole bunch of residents that's never seen the light of day. Amen. Planned Parenthood, amen? amen. I believe we, we populate heaven. <laughs> if, if no other reason, we, we're filling heaven up. That's right. And I believe there is, there, but heaven's not going to be an empty place. I believe heaven's going to be a very populated place. It's 1,500 miles square just in the capital city. That ain't all of heaven. What, you, huh? What? what? What do you mean that's all? He said, I saw the city descending down from God out, out of heaven. And he says, and the walls thereof and the street, and it's 1,500 miles, uh, 1,500. That's just the capital city coming down, folks. And I can't even grasp that. <laughs> and so if that's just the capital city, I have can guarantee you, and later on he says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. You say, and that ain't even got nothing to do with the capital city. That's just, you say, wait just a minute. You mean there's going to be enough? Yeah, I know. The books, it's in the Bible. It's good stuff. Amen. Right. And we get so caught up on the holy city, so everybody's going to heaven. Yeah, but that's just the city. That's just, that's just there. And I love, this in the book. I love the book. I'm a book lover. Amen. I, I'm going to give an account for this book. But he talks about these things and Jesus says these. And you say, why is he, does, he, does he talk about it this way? Because he likens it and wants us to understand that salvation is very narrow. It's not a Baptist salvation and it's not a Methodist salvation and it's not a assembly of God salvation. It's not a Catholic salvation. It's a it's a salvation through Christ and through Him alone. There's a lot of Baptists going to hell. <laughs> I know some of them. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, but I'm not making that judgment, Amen. But uh, I already did. But there's there's a lot of Methodists that's going to hell. There's a lot of Assembly of God that's going to hell. There's a lot of folks that's been saved, sanctified, filled the Holy Ghost, folk with tongues, still going to bust hell wide open. Right. There's folks that's taken the sacraments, the Catholic, the priest told them they're good to go. They got married in the thing, baptized the baby. They was confirmed in the church. They still going to bust hell wide open. There's deacons that's had their hands on them. People's anointed them. They've been deacons for years. And there's some of them going to bust hell wide open. There's people that sing in the choir in the uh, Episcopal church that's going to bust hell wide open. You say, what in the world? There's some Presbyterians that just think that they was already predestined to go to hell anyway. And they're just going to be like, they don't know what in the world they're going. And they're, you say, why is that so? Listen, the, the people are going to heaven are saved people. Saved people are going to heaven. That's who's going to heaven. You say, why are you Baptist? Because I believe that we believe the closest that lines up to this book. If I didn't, I'd be something else. Amen. Amen. But I'm not going to heaven because I'm a Baptist. Right. I'm going to heaven because I'm a Christian. Amen. <laughs> I'm going to heaven because I'm a Christian. Amen. You say, well, how do you... How, why would Jesus talk about it? Because he understands these two scriptures. He actually is the word. But look at John chapter 10 and verse 1. Let me show you these two scriptures. When he talks about how narrow is the narrow way. <laughs> how narrow is the gate that leads to life. How narrow is this gate that leads to life. Look in, in John chapter number 10 and verse 1. John chapter 10 and verse 1. Verily, verily, this is Jesus talking to the followers. I say to you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, some folks is trying to get into heaven. The same is a thief and a robber. Look at the next verse. 
But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Look in verse 3. To him the porter openeth, the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. Now verse 4. He that putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth forth before them, the sheep follow him, and they know his voice. You're like, what's going on? What's his voice? Who is he talking to? Go down verse 5. Stranger, it said, will they not follow, but will flee from him. For they know not the voice of stranger. You say, well, it's kind of building. It's like, who, who, what is this? Who is this? Look at the next verse. This parable, perilous parable. Yeah. Well, I just come up with new words. Sparable, amen. <laughs> this parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Why didn't they understand it? They didn't know him. If they would have known him, they would understand what he was talking about. If you go on down, and he goes on, in verse 7 he said this, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Anybody that tries to go to heaven on anything other than a relationship with Jesus Christ is a thief and a robber. Anybody that tries to crawl up any other way to get in is a thief and a robber. Jesus said the only way into the sheepfold is to come through the door. And he goes on to say he is the door. Then he goes on. He says it not only once. He says it in verse 9 again, but we'll read verse 8. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am, I am what? If by me, this is Christ talking, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. You say, that's pretty important. I think that's pretty narrow. You know, we get accused of being narrow. Yeah. I am. I am narrow. Yeah. I am. You say, well, y'all a bunch of Protestants. By the way, I'm not a Protestant. I never did join something to come out of it. Amen. You got to protest, so you got to join it to come out. There's been Christians that never was part of and never chose to be part of. They was killed. They was called Waldensians, Paulicans. They was called by different names, but doctrinally they never would join up with anybody that had ecclesiastical hierarchy that said, who could, who could go to heaven? They said, no, there's only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. And they have been killed, they have been butchered, they have been sawed in half, they have been hung out in gallows, they have been done down through the centuries, they've been burned in oil, and one of the seven wonders of the world in the middle of the Middle East was the gardens that was over there, and did you know that they kept them lit up at night by burning Christians on poles, is how they kept them lit up at night. They lit Christians' bodies on poles to light up the famous gardens. They never joined. Why? Because straight is the gate and there is the way that leadeth unto life. Amen. Let me show you one other scripture. Look in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, he says it this way. It's pretty narrow. Verse 12, chapter 4, verse 12. Jesus, this is them saying, neither is there salvation. This is what they preached. This is what the early church preached. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. Paul even said in Galatians, if, if we come back and say and preach another Jesus and that which you have received, let us be accursed. Right, right. He said if an angel from heaven shows up and says, oops, we got it wrong, there's another gospel of Jesus Christ. And by the way, you can order one of those on TV. <laughs> oh, yeah. Amen. They have found another gospel of Jesus Christ. And it was written 
by an angel, uh, Angel Moroni, give it to a guy by the name of Joseph Smith, and it's another gospel. Yeah. And they have their own book. I just read Galatians said, if an angel shows up from heaven and says, I got another gospel than that which you have received, let him be a curse. I don't have to do, I don't have to read it. Why? They told me one time they said, if you'll read this book, you'll get a burning in your bosom. I said, if you eat a Big Mac past 10 o'clock at night, you'll get a burning in your bosom. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. You will. <laughs> you, you'll get a burning in your bosom. That don't mean it's of God just because you get a feeling down inside. Right. You can get feelings that aren't aren't based on fact. But the Word of God has to be the primary. It has to be the focus. It has to be the... And Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Listen, Hope Hope Baptist Church, this church has been around for 191 years. And the same message would be that Christ is the way. That's right. That's right. <laughs> if Jesus doesn't come for 191 more years, the only way you will be able to grab onto the promise that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church is to keep the same message that Christ is the way, the truth, the life, and that no man cometh unto the Father but by Him. Amen. The gate is narrow. <laughs> I think it's pretty strange, and it might be a coincidence, that a lot of things that's, that's out in the entertainment world comes from Broadway. <laughs> you know what? I know a lot of things on the Broadway. And it ain't just plays. There's a lot of things that comes from Broadway. There's a lot of immoral living on Broadway. There's a lot of there's a lot of cheating and stealing and killing. There's a lot of things that happen. But you know what? Straight is the gate. And there's a way that leadeth unto life. I'm glad that I know that I know that I know that I'm saved. I'm glad I know that. I don't think so, hope so, maybe so. I know so. I've talked to people, they tell me, say, nobody really knows for sure. I say, that's a lie. And I know. <laughs> I know I'm saved. How do you know you're saved? Well, number one, he put his spirit in my heart. Romans chapter 8. You go ahead and take the test. It's Romans chapter 8. There's a test there you can take. He put his spirit in our spirit, crying, have a father. My heart cries out to God on a regular basis, saying, Daddy, help me. He bears witness that we are spirit, that we are the children of God. We love the brethren. We pass from no, we pass from death to life because we love the brethren. I love people that I wouldn't even like before I got saved. Amen. 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 Like yeah. <laughs> but I, I love people that I wouldn't even like. And that's nothing but let you know that you are a child of God. There are several things you can look at, and I and, and I pass most of them. <laughs> I'm working on the rest of them. Amen. But I find out that I know that I know that I know. I'm saved. I'm not being, I am saved. Yeah. I'm saved. And he also whoops my britches off. <laughs> he gives me a time. I'm glad God don't just jerk us up every time. Aren't you, the Bible says that, well, aren't you great? Aren't you grateful to God that he talks about that, that he doesn't punish us according to our iniquities? I'm glad he don't, I'm glad he don't just whoop me every time I do wrong. I'm glad he gives me rope. Because he can see down the road and say, you know what? That boy's doing this. He thinks he's getting by, but that's going to take about three years for him to run down that road. And then he's going to get to the end of that. He's going to go, oh, so that's why I didn't do it. God said, you know, that's enough punishment for him. I believe I'll let this go. You know what? God, sometimes he won't just jerk a knot in your tail. Sometimes he sees way down the road. And he's like, mm, that, he's going to reap that at the end. That's going to be enough with him. He does. But sometimes he will do it automatically. Yeah, he does. But other times, he'll, he's patient. He's long-suffering. But he also knows if I have one of them vault lessons, I'll remember it a whole lot longer. Amen. You ever had a vault lesson? Yeah. Like your daddy told you to put oil in your vehicle and you didn't do it? And then you had to buy a new motor? <laughs> and a quart of oil is a lot cheaper than a motor? You know, I've had some of them in my spiritual life. God told me to buy a quart of oil. And I was like, God, I got this. I know what I'm doing. Okay. Run, boy. 
I know what I'm doing. Okay. You go. And then when I say, oh God, I can't, I can't afford where I'm at. He goes, ah. I wonder how that happened. I come back crawling. Oh God. <laughs> it was me, oh God. It was me. 